Welcome to Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, where we bring evidence, experience, and perspective to make sense of today's leading health challenges. If you have questions or ideas for us, please send an email to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. This is Lindsay Smith-Rogers. Anopheles stevens eye, an invasive species of mosquito native to Southeast Asia, is finding its way to Africa, where it's made a comfortable home in urban areas and spreading malaria in places and to extents not normally seen. Today, we bring you an extended episode of Malaria Minute, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Malaria Research Institute, where guest host Thomas Locke discusses how researchers are tracking Stevens eye and how the invasive species could complicate efforts to control the disease in Africa. Let's listen. Malaria in Africa is mainly rural and peaks during the rainy season. The primary culprit is Africa's main malaria vector, Anopheles gambiae. But another malaria vector, called Anopheles stevensi, is making its way into the continent from Southeast Asia. Anopheles stevensi can transmit malaria in both rural and urban settings and breed in small volumes of water. Because it's not dependent on rainfall, it can transmit the disease all year round. It can even transmit Plasmodium vivax malaria, a form of the disease that can relapse. In one study in Kenya last year, 16 out of the 55 captured mosquitoes were Anopheles stevensi, almost a third. So just how much of a threat is Anopheles stevensi and what can be done? Hello and welcome to Malaria Minute Extended, a podcast sharing the human stories behind the world's leading malaria science. Produced by the Malaria Research Institute at the Bloomberg School of Public Health, this is the Johns Hopkins Malaria Minute. Extended. Erica Chomo is an entomologist from Kenya. He's dedicated his career to the study of insects and late last year got an unexpected call from someone working for the National Museum. They were collecting insects in urban settings in the county of Marzabit and turned to Eric for advice. They were actually looking for dragonfly larvae and breeding habitats for dragonfly larvae. They breed in the water. And they came across uh, mosquitoes that they thought were Northland in containers. So um, they reached out and they're like, we're seeing something strange. Um, do you guys want to check it out? So that's how we ended up sending a team out to Marsabit. And they went out there, they got some larvae and they were in containers. That, that is not traditionally how we find a Northland larvae, especially for the Northlands that we're used to in this area. The mosquitoes that transmit malaria in Kenya are Anopheline mosquitoes, most commonly Anopheles gambiae and Anopheles fenestus. They're widely touted to be some of the most effective transmitters of malaria in Africa. And if you want to find them, they're found in rural settings, in large volumes of water, not small containers in the city. The mosquitoes the National Museum found in Marzabit weren't a native species. We're able to identify them as Anopheles stevensi. Anopheles stevensi is not normally found in Africa, but instead in Southeast Asia. And just to confirm that they are indeed stevensi, um, some of them were reared to adults, so we were able to identify them using the characteristics of the morphology as stevensi. And then four of those samples were also shipped to the CDC in Atlanta, who then confirmed via sequencing that they were indeed stevensi. So from there, we went on and gave, um, submitted the report to WHO on mission. This is concerning to Eric. He's head of entomology at the Kenya Medical Research Institute. Part of the Kenyan government, the institute helps develop public health policy across a number of disease areas. The Kenya Medical Research Institute conducts all manner of research in collaboration with multiple partners. The output of what we do contributes towards surveillance and contributes towards guiding um, the management of, of the diseases that affect the nation in Kenya. In the global arena, Kenya accounts for around 1% of malaria cases, but in the country's court, the disease remains one of Kenya's top health concerns. In 2021, Kenya reported nearly 4 million malaria cases and over 700 malaria deaths. The discovery of Anopheles stevensi in the country is worrying. We worry about stevensi for for multiple reasons. 
One, Netflix is highly adaptable. Speaking to my colleagues in Ethiopia, they have phone statements initially everywhere. They will breed anywhere. And number two, they're very efficient vectors of both Plasmodium falciparum and Plasmodium vivax. In Kenya, our biggest burden has been Plasmodium falciparum. So it means that now we are at risk of transmission of Plasmodium vivax. Number three, even though they say that an oculus has a big preference for cattle, if you think about it moving to urban settings where people don't have animals, I mean, humans will be the primary um, host. And in those cases, with their uh, efficiency in transmission, you could see malaria cases going up. But this wasn't the first time that Anopheles stevensi has been discovered in Africa. In the past decade, the malaria vector has been found in Djibouti, Ethiopia, Sudan, Somalia and Nigeria. And in Kenya, if Anopheles stevensi develops a foothold in the cities, the consequence could be severe. Now, if you think about the urban setting scenario, most of our populations in urban settings, especially those who are born outside of the malaria endemic areas of Kenya, are likely to be naive for malaria. So if we're going to get malaria for the first time, we're expecting to see much more severe infections. We could have increased mortality due to malaria. And then lastly, think about the budget. The envelope that's currently available for malaria, it's fixed. It's a fixed budget. We're not getting additional money. If anything, it's shrinking. So if we have expanding... Um, Areas where we have transmission of malaria things to state fires, then we will be talking about dividing the little resources we currently have for control of malaria in the mostly endemic and, um, and epidemic prone areas to areas that we normally traditionally do not have malaria. So what can be done? Seth Irish is a technical officer at the WHO responsible for coordinating work into the spread of Anopheles stevensi. Anopheles stevensi is a good malaria vector. It's actually used in laboratory studies of malaria because it's relatively easy to rear and also a good biological vector of malaria. And one of the interesting things about it in terms of its ecology is that it's able to use kind of smaller uh, bodies or or containers of water that um, other Anopheles mosquitoes don't usually use. We are, are really trying to make sure that everybody's, first of all, aware of this issue. Um, The WHO put out a vector alert back in 2019 when when most people weren't really talking about this issue very much uh, and has continued to to push to get more information. He looks back to when Stephen Sai was first discovered in Africa, in Djibouti. It all started in 2012 when Anafli Stephen Sai was first detected in Djibouti. I think the Djibouti scenario is really the one that we're worried about, where we have almost a a 30-fold increase in malaria cases. That's where we're we're quite concerned. We haven't seen this in so much in other places, although we have uh, uh, an outbreak of malaria in an urban um, setting in Ethiopia, where they had quite a high number of cases compared to what they normally have. But what's driving this? How and why is Stevensai migrating from where it's native, in Southeast Asia, into Africa? We live in an increasingly urban and connected world, and so this kind of event is probably going to become more likely rather than less likely, as the time that shipping containers take to get from one side of the world to the other is reduced, then uh, it makes it easier and easier for mosquitoes to, to hitch a ride and move to a new suitable area. The strain that they found in Djibouti seems to have a close link to Anopheles Stevens Eye from Pakistan, um, which might indicate shipping avenues, which would, which would make sense because Djibouti has a, a very large port. Uh, and so that could be one way that it's moving. So shipping could be one way in which Stevens Eye is entering Africa, but it's spreading. Djibouti is a port city in the Horn of Africa, in the western part of the continent. But in 2020, Stephen Sai was found in Nigeria, toward the east. So what can be done? Seth says the right policy response is not entirely clear. We don't know the, the right response. This is something new with potential risks for increasing malaria um, in urban settings or or potentially taking money away from rural settings where we have the highest burden of malaria. I, I am worried. I think that this is you know, a change to our, our situation in, in terms of malaria epidemiology, and we have to pay really close attention. I think we should do as much as we can to quickly assess the situation, to understand the spread, to understand how it's moving, 
uh, and then and just as quickly move to ways of controlling uh, Anopheles Tidenzai. Uh, and this might be something that, you know, municipalities start to take some some responsibility for this and and manage the the urban malaria mosquitoes and the national programs focus on the rural settings or there may be other configurations of of control that work better but i think we have to to at least rush to figuring out what the appropriate response is um that's a i think an urgent situation yeah one of the WHO's initiatives is a threat map. Like with COVID maps, it shows you where Anopheles stevensi has been spotted. The native species are in green, the invasive ones in red. But in some places, like Djibouti, stevensi has been there for over a decade, continuing to breed and transmit malaria. After so many years, can we still call it an invasive species? I think the fact that it's been in Africa for, for 10 years... Uh, is quite a number of generations in, in mosquito lifetime. So I think we can continue to talk about it as invasive because it's continuing to spread, it seems. Um, but in terms of its presence in the Horn of Africa, it seems that it's it's a, now a local vector. So Anopheles stevensi, though once a species only found in Southeast Asia, seems to be becoming a local species in some parts of Africa, and with its probable links to shipping and increasing globalization, Eric argues it could get worse because of climate change. There was a recent um, letter that was written to a journal, and in it, the authors talked about um, the effect of climate change on the expanding geographical scale for malaria, for malaria mosquitoes. But looking in the context of state high, and thinking about global warming, thinking about the fact that many of the areas that used to be high altitude and therefore much cooler and not conducive for mosquitoes are now getting conducive for mosquitoes. And you have a mosquito that, that is so efficient at invading new areas. In a short while, we could be talking about TFSA in the really large urban areas, Nairobi, for example. And if that were to happen, it would be a disaster. If we don't do anything about it now, we will likely going to have a disaster in, in a few years. Given how quickly climate change is changing our weather patterns, is changing our um, areas that are receptive to anopheles mosquitoes, but it's potentially going to be sooner rather than later. Sooner rather than later. Anopheles stevensi could redefine the epidemiology of malaria in Africa, and this worries both Eric and Seth. Rural malaria, as the status quo, could be turned upside down as stevensi gains a foothold in urban settings. The fallout could divert resources away from rural settings, and climate change could further extend stevensi's sphere of influence. But there's a glimmer of hope. Data and surveillance, like Eric's work in Kenya and the WHO threat map, are helping us understand the scale of the problem. It's hoped that this understanding will help us get a handle on it. You've been listening to Malaria Minute Extended, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Malaria Research Institute. I'm Thomas Locke. Public Health On Call is a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health Produced by Joshua Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith Rogers, Stephanie Desmond, and Grace Ciceri. Audio production by J.B. Arbogast, Holly Cardinal, Spencer Greer, Matthew Martin, and Philip Porter, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Production support from Catherine Ricardo. Social media run by Grace Ciceri and Eliza Rosen. If you have questions or ideas for us, please send an email to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Thank you for listening.